Hello, friends of Aaron's Audio Corner. Today I'm reviewing the SVS Prime bookshelf speaker. Retails for about seven to eight hundred dollars per pair, depending on what finish you get. This pair came directly from SVS on loan for me to review because I had a lot of you saying, Hey, when are you going to review the speaker? And I said, Hey, I would love to, but it costs money. So I just reached out to SVS and they said, Sure, we'll send you a pair to review. And that is that. They also said, Hey, if you don't mind, just mention that we have some cool speaker cables. And I thought, you know what, for you taking the time to send them out to me, that's fine. So here's their cool little speaker cables. You can go check it out. I'll link, they leave a link to them in the description below. Um, I've actually not even used them. You can see they're still in the package. So, uh, but yeah, that's kind of the moral of that story. Let's see here. This speaker to me can be best described as a speaker that is not linear. Uh, sounds a bit forward in the mid-range area around maybe like one to three kilohertz. And then the treble is a little bit bright. So if you have them aimed directly on axis, my recommendation is to tow them out a little bit. And then in my experience, most of the people that are using SVS speakers are using them with a home theater setup. And that is a good thing because most home theater setups have auto equalization or the ability to go and manually EQ the response. And in my opinion, what you're going to want to do is you're going to bring that one to three kilohertz level down a little bit. And that will take some of the forwardness out of the sound. And what do I mean by forwardness? Well, I'm going to apply some EQ to my voice right now. And you can hear the difference as I talk. So it sounds just a little bit like physically it's forward. It's a weird thing. You're not manually adjusting where I'm at, but it almost sounds like I'm actually physically closer. There's more emphasis placed on that mid-range area. That's not neutral. If you like it, okay. But personally speaking, I would prefer to not have it. So now I'm going back to normal, and this is my normal talking voice from here on. The good thing about this speaker, though, is that it does take well to EQ in that particular area, and it does have a lot of good output, especially for a speaker this size. Most speakers this size will have compression issues and distortion issues as you start to increase the volume, whereas this speaker doesn't have that. It's also worth noting that this speaker design is about seven years old, so it's not really up to date with some of the speakers that I've measured of late. And I would think that going forward with a new design, if and when SVS decides to create one, that it would probably be more linear. So SVS, if you decide to make a Rev 2 to the speaker, great. I personally would advise you to maybe focus on bringing that level in the one to three kilohertz region down a little bit so it sounds more natural and maybe even take a little bit off the top end so it also sounds a little bit more natural. Now that top end will help to add some detail to some people's ears. But personally speaking, that's a pseudo detail that I prefer not to have. What happens if you have a song that is already bright? Well, it's going to sound even brighter. If you happen to listen to music that is dull in level, so maybe it's rolled off on the top end, okay, this might work out for you. But I generally prefer to have a speaker that is more neutral so I can apply my own equalization to it if I want to, such as just tonal balance or shelving filters or anything of that nature that you can find in most AVR. With all of that said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start going through some of this data. Now, all of this data was captured using my Clipple near Nearfield Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows you to get anechoic data of a speaker in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage, which you see in this video. The reason that that is important is because it takes the room out of the equation, so you see exactly what the speaker's doing, and that then enables you to get a good idea of what the speaker's gonna do in your room. Now you might be thinking, how in the world can this anechoic response of the speaker in a non-room tell me what the speaker is going to sound like in the actual room? Well, there's a whole science around this, and I would suggest you look into Floyd Tool's book. I'll provide a link to that in the description below as well. But basically what we find is that summing up certain information from the off-axis response, so the sound that goes to the side of the speaker and in the front, above and below, will allow you to predict with very good accuracy what the speaker is going to sound like tonally in your room. And then looking at other aspects of data, such as the horizontal dispersion, we can get an idea of what the soundstage width, maybe even the depth might sound like as well. So let's start going through some of that data. First up is the CEA 2034 data set. Now this provides you the on-axis response, the early reflections, the sound power and directivity indices. If you're curious what each of those means, you can click this little drop down. This is all on my website, by the way, and it will tell you exactly what those are. I have a whole series of videos dedicated to this information. 
click this little playlist up here if you want to watch it or go and watch it at a later time. But for now, we're going to hit some of the highlights. The on-axis response is the most important response that you're going to be measuring because this is direct sound. This is the first thing that you hear. Generally speaking, you want a flat on-axis response. And we can see that this on-axis response in black is not flat. It does have that plateau in the mid-range area, as I said before, between about one, two, three kilohertz, give or take. We see a dip at around four kilohertz, and that dip is caused by diffraction. Diffraction is as a sound radiates to the edge of the speaker baffle, it creates another point source. Those point sources fire back at your ears, and the delay between the original sound and the sound that hits the edge of the speaker, that creates a bit of a dip in response that is a diffraction effect. So they're basically out of phase at some frequency. Now the frequency is dependent upon the wavelength and the distance of the actual baffle relative to the speaker itself. It's kind of confusing, but basically what you're saying is, hey, this little edge point over here is creating a sound source as well. This guy's creating a sound source. They don't like each other. They kind of cancel out. And at that certain frequency, which I said is one of the speakers around four kilohertz or so, what you have is a dip as you listen directly on axis, but as you go off axis, that little dip is smooth more and more till you get to the side where there is no dip anymore from edge diffraction. I also mentioned that there's a little bit of a bump in the high frequency area and it's right through here. And relatively speaking, it's kind of minor, especially when you're talking about what happens at around this two to kilohertz area. But I also wanted to kind of note that because that it is something that I noticed when I was listening to the speaker and just towing them out a little bit, like facing them more into the room, helped to resolve that for my ears. The other aspect that we wanna pay attention to primarily is down here, this ERDI in the dashed blue. So this is a comparison between basically the frontal hemisphere of the sound of the speaker versus a smaller window in the sound of the speaker, which is known as the listening window. That is the green dashed line, which you see right through here. So you're comparing those two and you're trying to say, okay, what happens as I move to the side of the speaker or above the speaker? And really for us, what we care about is how good can we EQ the speaker? I mean, how well does it take to EQ? So what you wanna see is you wanna see a linear response. That can be a flat line, that can be a sloping line, that can be anything as long as it's linear, line shaped. When it goes from line to no line and then back to line, that indicates that there's gonna be an area where you're gonna have trouble to equalize the response. And that would be right through here. So you can see we're linear and you're getting more linear up into about two kilohertz. That's because the midwoofer on the speaker is tightening up its radiation pattern. It's getting narrower and narrower as you get to higher frequencies. And then the tweeter comes in and boom, now we're wide again. Well, this area right through here is gonna be hard to equalize, but this area right through here won't be so hard to equalize. So there's different aspects of the speaker that are gonna be harder to equalize than others. And that's why I said that one to three kilohertz area mostly will take well to EQ. Now, some of this is also due to the actual vertical displacement from the tweeter to the mid range. If the tweeter were closer to the mid range or the mid woofer, then this wouldn't be as severe and it would be more readily taking to EQ. Well, I'm not sure that made sense, but hopefully you know what I mean. Remember earlier I talked about predicting what the speaker would sound like in your room. Well, that's what this is for. This is the estimated in-room response. If you wanna see how this is defined, click this drop down and it gives you an idea. It tells you it's 44% on axis, 44% early reflections off the sidewall, the floor and the ceiling. With this prediction, what we can see is that the response is actually pretty linear above about two kilohertz. But for me, the problem was that below about two kilohertz, things sounded more mellow and it actually made the upper mid range or the mid range area between that one to three kilohertz area sound more forward. And that's the problem that I had primarily with the speaker to my ears. Now, anecdotally, I went back and I looked at some others reviews and some other people who talked about what they heard when they listened to the speaker. I did this all after I measured and listened and all that stuff, but I found a couple other people that kind of noted the same thing. So I thought it worth pointing out that I'm not alone in my primary takeaway of the speaker. Let's take a look at the Horizontal radiation, that's the sound that's spit out into the room by the speaker. Now the red is the primary SPL, the highest level of sound. And then as you trend toward blue, that's the lower level of sound. Zero degrees is directly on axis. That is the front of the speaker. 180 is behind the speaker. So it makes sense that the red is at the front of the speaker. And what I'm looking at here is just the general trend. And I'm seeing it's about plus or minus 70 degrees to about plus or minus 80 degrees up through the upper mid-range and lower treble region. 
And then when you get to about five to eight kilohertz, the tweeter starts to narrow up and it starts to beam. So no longer is it very wide, it's also starting to focus up its radiation pattern. This is typical of a dome tweeter on a flat baffle. Generally speaking, this speaker is pretty wide in radiation, so it has a good wide sound stage. In terms of vertical response, this is important to understand because you wanna make sure that your ear is at the right level to get the best sound that you can possibly get. And that's what this provides us. This hole right here at about negative 30 degrees means that you don't need to go below 30 degrees of the tweeter line. This dip in response above about plus 15 degrees indicates that you don't need to go above the tweeter about 15 degrees. Generally speaking, you're gonna to wanna to stay on axis with the tweeter line, but you do have about plus or minus 10 degrees that you can go and you're gonna be kind of in a safe zone. So if you have these in a home theater, you could be okay for people in a back row depending on how far away they are of the speaker and you might wanna play around with moving the speaker up and down. You may have to give up a little bit of that prime sound that you're gonna get in the front primary seats if you want the back listeners to also have a good sound. But with plus or minus 10 degrees, I'd say you have a decent little bit of a window to provide good even sound for most people vertically. Now talking about the low frequency extension, I like to use this graph just to give me an idea of how linear the response is. We can see the average sensitivity measured is about 87 dB. The linearity of the speaker is within about plus or minus three dB, which is generally okay, but I will say that for a speaker of this price, I would have expected better. The F3 of the speaker is 72 Hertz, which isn't very, very low, but it does give you enough room to go in and have good response when made it up to a subwoofer. This is the distortion at 86 dB. And you can see that this response, the distortion profile is actually really good. It's below negative 40 dB, which is 1% THD, above about 60 Hertz. That's really good. And if we go to, now if we go to 96 dB, you can see that you have increased above 1%. You have a little bit of some sort of resonance right here around two to 300 Hertz. But for the most part, your THD is still pretty low at 96 dB. Now let's check dynamic range. Dynamic range is a way to quantify just how linear their speaker is as you increase the volume or you have a sudden transient attack. Ideally, all of these different color lines are flat. That means there is no deviation from the lowest volume to the highest volume. The lowest volume being 76 dB and the highest volume being 102 dB. But for the most part, I'm actually really happy with what I'm seeing here. Until you get to about 80 Hertz, the speaker does very well. All things considered, I've seen speakers that cost more money than this measure much worse actually. So in terms of compression and linearity and dynamic range, I say that this speaker is pretty good. Now flipping to multi-tone distortion, which is a way to test the distortion of the speaker as it's playing multiple sounds at one time, kind of like if it were playing pink noise, emulating real music, or maybe even watching a movie. Negative 20 dB is kind of a personal mark. And if it's above negative 20 dB, if it goes up even higher than that, then it's a problem. But this speaker stays pretty well below that throughout from 20 Hertz all the way to 20 kilohertz. So it gets a thumbs up from me there. I have provided equalization. If you want to check this out, you can actually just go into your mini DSP if you have one and apply some of these equalization settings and then you'll get this response. But notice, you still have an issue around two to three kilohertz that doesn't equalize out very well. And then you also have a little bit of a diffraction element still around this four kilohertz area that you can't really equalize out. So while you can get a flat on axis response, you still won't get a really smooth linear in-room response entirely, but it does make a difference. And I do recommend that if you have equalization, to seriously consider using this to help you along your way. The best way I can sum up the performance of this speaker and my overall thoughts is to say it is not the most neutral speaker I've heard and I definitely would do some things to make it a more neutral speaker and make it more pleasing to my ear. However, it is a nice looking speaker and it has really good build quality, I will say that. It also has really good ability to get loud as long as you use the subwoofer and it doesn't have distortion or any kind of compression issues above about 80 Hertz, so it's a clean speaker. I do implore you to consider using equalization with the speaker though, to give it a more neutral tonal balance. And that's it for this review. I appreciate you watching. If you like these kind of technical thorough reviews and from an honest standpoint where I'm not getting any kickbacks from doing any of this, I'm just relying on the data, conveying to you what I hear and what I see in the data that kind of aligns with it, then please consider subscribing to this channel. You can do so in the subscribe button below. Make sure you like and thumbs up and hit the notification bell. 
If you want to support the channel, there's a number of ways you can do that. One is through Patreon, which you can do through my website right here. Another is you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of my affiliate links. Now, I know some people have a problem with affiliate links, but hey, you got the data. If I'm lying, you can call me out on it because you've got the data. The affiliate link just serves as a way to help me make a little bit of revenue off of anything that you want to buy from socks, underwear to televisions or whatever, depending on which affiliate link you want to use from Crutchfield Audio Advice or Amazon or whatever else. It's up to you. Nobody's forcing you to buy anything, but it is definitely helpful to me if you decide to go that route. With all that said, I appreciate you watching and I will talk to you all later. Peace.